if you're competitive, markets are quite quite a good arena to play in, but you have to be at least in the top three to make money. Turn $25,000 into $125 million essentially, by a bit more. You can segment things in different ways, but I think uh, what we call trading at Winterview is mostly market making. Private side is easier and harder. Private side is essentially access and filter. Can you get access to the right deals? And when you have access to the right deals, can you say this is a good deal I want to invest in or not? You needed to have at least 14 investments to see your money back. And usually the first seven or eight, so just go down to zero. You have three or four or five that basically return your money and give you a bit more. So then you tend to have one investment every less than 10 that actually just has, that, you know, yields 80% of your return. This episode is brought to you by Gnosis. Gnosis builds decentralized infrastructure for the Ethereum ecosystem. With a rich history dating back to 2015 and products like Safe, CowSwap, or Gnosis Chain, Gnosis combines needs-driven development with deep technical expertise. This year marks the launch of Gnosis Pay, the world's first decentralized payment network. With the Gnosis card, you can spend self-custody crypto at any visa-accepting merchant around the world. If you're an individual looking to live more on-chain or a business looking to white-label the stack, visit GnosisPay.com. There are lots of ways you can join the Gnosis journey. Drop in the Gnosis DAO governance form, become a Gnosis validator with a single GNO token and low-cost hardware, or deploy your product on the EVM-compatible and highly decentralized Gnosis chain. Get started today at Gnosis.io. Cars One is one of the biggest node operators globally and help you stake your tokens on 45 plus networks like Ethereum, Cosmos, Celestia and DYDX. More than 100,000 delegators stake with Chorus One, including institutions like BitGo and Ledger. Staking with Chorus One not only gets you the highest years, but also the most robust security practices and infrastructure that are usually exclusive for institutions. You can stake directly to Chorus One's public node from your wallet, set up a white label node, or use the recently launched product, Opus, to stake up to 8,000 ETH in a single transaction. You can even offer high-yield staking to your own customers using their API. Your assets always remain in your custody, so you can have complete peace of mind. Start staking today at Chorus.one. Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about technology projects and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Brian Crane, and today I'm speaking with Yo Turpin, who is the co-founder uh, of Wintermute. Wintermute is one of the largest, or maybe the largest, uh, market-making company uh, in crypto. And yeah, I think it's a, a field I'm super excited to dive in here. So uh, thanks so much for coming on, Yon. Thanks, Brian. Thanks for inviting us. We're the largest spot market-making firm. We're not the largest across derivatives yet. Not yet. Working on it. But so spot, spot is true. DeFi most likely as well, uh, getting there, you know, working to be so, so I, we can't claim the full name yet <laughs> across the crypto space in general. We need to, we need to do a bit more on derivatives, but, but we're working on this. Thanks for the invite. No, thanks so much for, for coming on. Uh, yeah, we, we, we hung out a bit in Singapore recently and it was really uh, great to talk. And so I'm super excited to like dive into, dive into Wintermute. Well, maybe to start off. Like share a little bit, like how did you become interested in trading and markets? Well, okay, trading and markets, so be well beyond well before crypto. So I'm um, to be like full disclaimer. So I'm 41, and I started to get in, interested in trading when I was 12, and uh, I was essentially reading um, newspapers. So my my dad would be a subscriber to something called the Figaro in in France, and they had essentially that a main newspaper for just typical news, uh, politics and the, and the likes. And they had like, they had like uh, also what we call the Salmon Papers, which are essentially like similar to the FT, sort of the, the market papers. And I was just going through this and I was just took a, took a passion to read through that. One of these kids who had kind of um, 120 options of like what they wanted to do when they grow up. Uh, so I wanted to be, you know, like whatever, doctor, X amount of physician, a, a astrophysicist between essentially the age of seven and 12. 
And then from 12, I really wanted to be a trader. So I I got into this discussion with my my dad had a, a like a stock portfolio that he would manage. We didn't have we didn't have the internet per se. We had Minitel, so Minitel was quite quite popular in France at the time. You just log in into the six six three seven. It was similar to a web page, but you just type in a number, uh, and essentially we just log in into the what was the credit union at the time, and we just we could just buy buy stocks as such. So I started I started like this. Uh, putting some putting some orders in to 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 buy stocks on with my with my dad's money when I was twelve. It wasn't it wasn't a ton of money, but it was just enough to be able to have a passion for it. And then I uh, I got him to buy me like a, an options book when I was fifteen. So my first options book, and then basically I couldn't trade options. So basically I found a way to trade warrants. You so essentially you could only buy stuff. I was right directionally, but I realized that. The banks on the other side. So essentially, warrants are a bit different from options in the way that it's issued by banks, um, or they're like a warrant issuer. And essentially, they were taking so much margin that I was I was right in my bets, but I was giving too much margin away. And it's probably one of the first things that led me to think of more like market making per se. Uh, so I kind of hired one of my like a little cousin who's I think he's five years younger than me over a summer, and I was going through like sort of finding arbitrage across the page and so on. So anyway, I started. Started quite early on markets uh, in general. I think the theme has always been that I would go through different subjects and I would get a bit bored of it. Um, half of my family is entrepreneurs, half of my family are educators. And then one thing I, I really didn't want to do at the time is just you know not be a teacher as such because I thought it was just a bit too repetitive, you know, going through the same lessons and, and teaching the same things every year. And one aspect in markets that I love it is it just changes all the time. You know, these economic cycles, they say every three, four years or so. You can see that in crypto where you get like a, you know, winter people call it more like seasons and such. And it just changes enough and it's noisy enough that it forces you to relearn things and so on. So I found that, oh, if I if I want to have some sort of career for 10, 20 plus years, it needs to be linked with markets. So in a way that it needs to just be refreshing enough. Yeah, that's that's the long short of it. And then I ended up training my first futures when I was eighteen. Got someone to 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 write off, sign off a, a professional investor letter for me to trade futures on Bursarama when I was eighteen as a as an internship. Basically, I qualified that as an internship with the, uh, the school. And then um, and then uh, yeah, I wanted to like a bank as the first sort of gap year, and then wanted to do trading as a first job at twenty three. So when you got interested in trading this early, you mentioned one of the things you liked was this, the fluctuating, the change. Do you, do you think that was the thing that kind of caught your attention and got you to, so deep in there? Or were there like other aspects that ended up being so fascinating for you about trading and markets? There's a um, competitive level. That's interesting. There's a, there's a, there's a few things. I did some sales trading before doing trading like professionally. And I found that sales trading was not always aligned with the customers and I didn't really like it. And I found that trading was much more aligned with, and it's pretty clear where the PL comes from. Like it's just, um, I found that it was just a very honest way of, of, of making money. So I, I quite, I quite like that aspect. You get very clear feedback, very tangible feedback. If you're doing things right, you basically make money. If you're doing things wrong, you lose money. It is much more like honest per se. So I think it gave me a sense of independence as well, to the degree that you can trade some things, you know, or on your own as such. But I think it was more. Uh, there's also you know, quite a lot of things that we do today that to be data, which we can only do because we have the infrastructure, because we have the team in the background. Uh, there's quite a lot of things that have to be quite collaborative between, you know, getting. Everything aligned between the right access to capital, right access to exchanges, right access to, to um, an inventory per se, um, right strategies, and so on. So I think I think there's also a collaborative aspect that's interesting. There, I think if you're competitive, markets are quite quite a good arena to play in because it's global pretty much from day one. So if you think about us when we started in the crypto space, it was essentially global from day one. So you know. You know if it's going to work pretty quickly, then it's you know just drawing some sort of parallel with the zero to one. Like when it when it works, you know you want to be in the top 
three definitely. Ideally, you're the first one in a certain vertical as such. So say so you want to be first one in you know spot spot trading as such. Um, but you have to be at least in the top three to make to make money. But no, we we interact on Twitter here and there and so on, and it's more about. I think people get somehow satisfied to be doing a bit better, but I think the the realization, especially in trading, is that is you need to be doing better than the competition all the time, and um, and it's a bit more of a you know so there's this marginal advantages that you need to to add on to that make it quite competitive. So it's it's just um, yeah, keeps you on your toes. It, it, I want to go into this, but maybe before that. Then what's the story of how uh, Vintimute started? There's a convergence of two things. There's a convergence of um, Yevgeny set up the company 25th of July 2017. And he, he was doing like a little uh, sort of hackathons here and there with our first CTO, Haro. And then on my side, I essentially uh, had already built a few companies, a few trading related companies, but obviously also some startup studio um, a bit more of a, of, of a VC advisory firm as well. And on my side, I was going back into trading in 2016, 17. And I was sitting next to this ex Marshall Waste. I don't know if you know of Marshall Waste, but it's, a, it's probably the largest long short hedge fund in London. That, you know, uh, Sir, Sir Philip Marshall, I think it's, I think it's a Philip, uh, made you know, a few billions out of it. But essentially, they managed something like 86, 90 billion dollars of. Of uh, the UM and they and they do to do a lot of uh, you know long short uh, more in the equity space, and uh, one of their first employees was sitting up was sitting not too far from me on a trading desk and he was setting up his own macro fund and he was all over crypto in 2017, so we reviewed a lot of ICOs together about 56 I think, and he wanted to have a macro hedge fund that would have actually a crypto sleeve what they call it so essentially you have a macro hedge fund that have different strategies and you have a sleeve of it so part of the allocation is in crypto. And he wanted me to manage that allocation. So it came to mind that, oh, I can't do this alone. I need a, a um, you know, I can try it, but I need someone else to help with, you know, just, just automate like everything. So more of a CTO. And I need another trader because it's 24 7. And then essentially just that, I reconnected, just discussing very openly with some ex colleagues from, from trading, um, suggesting me to reconnect with Yudgeni. And then we, we aligned on, on this and I joined in as a co-founder, essentially late 2017. Uh, we put everything on paper with uh, with our CTO actually on uh, in early 2018. Um, so that's the, that's the general thing that he he had just left a trading farm and he wanted to do something in crypto. And uh, and I had basically the allocation. We didn't we did not end up taking money from from that fund actually, uh, but that was enough to just just rejuvenate it like uh, rekindle the interest for me to to get into crypto and. Uh, Philosophically, for me, it's more like I had done both trading and VC before, and I found that crypto was super interesting in terms of like democratizing like liquid. This is what we call like liquid venture, essentially. So very early stage bets, but um, but that you could get access from uh, just with trading very very early on, which I couldn't find in the private markets anymore, like within private and public markets in Web two. To to add some background to that, Brian, Web two. Like um, I had done first non-listed investments in 2008, and I was a pretty active angel investor, so in London and so on between 2012 and 15, 16, let's call it. And what you, I think you still have this in Web two, where in the past, like 90s or so, you'd be able to, uh, you'd, you'd be a seed investor at Amazon. Amazon just lists like three years later. Some, some sometime around 99, you can still buy Amazon at one dollar. You can actually get a lot of the growth, and you can get a lot of the upside. But after 2010, especially, well, you get into the Uber listing, you get into the Facebook listings and stuff, and like, there's not there's not necessarily a ton of upside left. Uh, so everything just lists like 10, 15 years into the life of the company, and it's much more well what we call in crypto exit liquidity, but basically equity like the typical Web two. Uh, shareholders of listing companies just end up becoming, you know, exit liquidity for VCs or, or private equity groups, essentially. So I was, I found it really refreshing that crypto was trying to solve that problem, essentially. And uh, another aspect that I love in crypto is it's more like I've 
down with people in the trading space and the hedge fund space, from the FS space and so on. And people can be a bit cagey in, in those, in those uh, spheres. And I found that actually like people in crypto are always quite quite open. And maybe yeah, maybe you met some scammers here and there, but actually in general, like, people are quite uh, that pretty good will and, uh, and uh, quite a lot more interesting to interact with. So I'd love to get a bit into sort of trading and like, I think a lot of people, they will have, and I, you know, they, they will know trade, a lot of listeners will know sort of trading in the sense of, you know, okay, I have some US dollar, some euro or something. I want to buy some Bitcoin. I go on like an exchange and I put in, uh, you know, maybe a market order or maybe a limit order. And I, I buy, I buy some tokens, right? Like, or, or like maybe I do it on the exchange, I buy some shares. But I think that's probably the extent to which most people, uh, you know, listening here will understand trading. And obviously that's something very different from, I think, the things you did previously at, uh, you know, before crypto, at, you know, this trading company or then Advent Mute. So can you tell a bit like what what's trading when, when you say, you know, you're trading, like what does that mean and what does that look like? You can segment things in different ways, but I think uh, what we call trading at Wintermute is mostly market making. So essentially, like within the order book, so within in, in, in a marketplace, within an exchange, and we we we're there to always be there so that if someone wants to buy or sell, there's someone on the other side, someone like us, market making. There's someone on the other side there to to fill our order. Um, because let's say if if you Brian, if we both individuals. And somehow, like you want to sell Bitcoin at seventy k, and I want to buy it at sixty k, nothing happens, you know. And then the market makers are there to make sure that, you know, like we 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 the, we always show uh, what's what's called a bid and an offer, so a price at which we can buy and a price at which we can uh, we can sell. And then we all we we trying to be there to always uh, to 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 make to make trading easier and the cheapest possible. Um, so what we call trading tends to be you know associated with market making. Now. Most people, to your point, like most people call trading and like trying to buy it with at one dollar and hope that it goes to two dollars, uh, you know, and and that's uh, that's often, yeah, not the greatest strategy. I think the way that most people should be trading in in crypto is to see it as venture, and essentially like to put X amount of money. Either they don't do any research and just stay in like BTC and ETH and sort of the, the top sort of four or five names as such. Um, we start to see more what's called, you know, more basket products and more index products as such that, that would give you exposure to the top 10, 20, 30 names, um, which is for most people is probably a better way to do things. As, uh, as at, have you trying to, I mean, I don't know, how do you try? Let's ask this, this start that way. Uh, do you, I know you've done some venture investments, but uh, do you do you trade anything any liquid tokens? I'm very like buy and hold and don't do much else. And you know, do, maybe do you do any do do you have any leverage when you take a position? Or? No, no. Okay, sounds maybe like you leverage. It's pretty good. I I don't have the impression that I'm good at predicting you know, basically market movements. So I don't, I don't try to do that. Yeah. So, I mean, that's quite reassuring. I have made money historically with some, some cycles like in stocks or so like taking directions, but, but through, through previous firms, not, not through, not necessarily through Wintermute. As, as VCs, as the, as the venture arm is doing quite well, but it's very much like venture investment. So again, to separate like, I think what you refer to as trading is much more liquid investments, but on the private side, private side is is private side is easier and harder. Private side is essentially access and filter. Can you get access to the right deals? And when you have access to the right deals, can you say this is a good deal I want to invest in or not? And and that's that's venture for you. The problem usually of venture or or you know in crypto or in some other spaces is just um it's just that you you married to the position. The good thing with it is that you don't tend to have any leverage. So if it goes down to zero, it goes down to zero. But you you you, you get psychologically dude, it's much more used to to things going down to zero. Now you'll understand why I mentioned this for, for trading. 
is I think most people should consider, even when it's liquid crypto, they should consider it like a venture bet. They should consider that they're actually making an investment that actually should be pretty much risen down to zero. And they also should look at the stats of actually venture investments. So venture investments for like, I don't have the stats for crypto, but like for Web2 Angel, like even 10, 15 years ago, you could already get all the stats where you needed to have at least 14 investments to see your money back. And usually the first seven or eight, so just go down to zero. You have three or four or five that basically return your money or give you a bit more. And then you tend to have one investment every less than 10 that actually just has, like, you know, yields 80% of your return. And that causes some challenges when you think of how people trade, which means that um, the winners should essentially return 10 plus times their money. And I think it's very, very hard psychologically for most people to think of like keeping something that does 10x and not not sell it before it reaches 10x. Another parallel with this is that, um, do you know what valuation the Uber investors invest in seed? It's 2008. So 2008, do you know, do you know what valuation they invested? I don't know, no. $3 million. So essentially when Uber listed, people had a five and a half thousand X. So whatever J. Carl and his friends and son made like $25,000 into $125 million essentially, or a bit more. But um, that, that's, that's basically the math. So if it, imagine if Uber had been liquid before that, I'm pretty sure they would have holds, you know, sold some of it. And it's a bit of a challenge of like thinking of investing in crypto is uh, you, have, you end up with a liquid venture and then you need to find a way to trade maybe, you know, but like if you sell your five, if you have 100x, but then it turns into a 5,000x, it's quite a big miss. So it brings us sort of the challenges of like comparing sort of venture and like trading, but trying to find the best way to trade is, is actually pretty hard. So with, with the market making that you guys do at Vintimute, how do you make money? We basically are forced into a position we don't want. We call the position is basically being long or short. So long as you make money if things go up, short to make money if things go down. And we're forced into a position by providing you know, liquidity, by just basically saying, if you want to buy Bitcoin for me, yeah. Because let's, let's say there's a particular coin and then you, you, have, in, you have buy orders and you have sell orders. Uh, and so that means you have to hold... Uh, both sides what costs us money in the first place is infrastructure people to you know run algos to send the orders and so on cost of capital to uh, cost of capital to, to borrow usually borrow the coins you know on each side um, and then even if sometimes we get slightly cheaper borrows but there's still commitments there's still some things that are associated with it and the borrows are often from the um, from the team or foundation or whoever is issuing the token or that's much less than half of what we have in the balance sheet but but yeah some some of the borrows are some of the borrows are from foundations some of the borrows are used to be from the lending borrowing platforms you know like BlockFi and the rest and then you know, most of them actually wouldn't bust so we have some borrows in DeFi that you all know through like wildcat people the, the maple of, of the world and so on but essentially um, yeah, a lot of borrowers come from you know, some of our shareholders or so, or just, just direct from you know, family offices and so on. So we, we borrow directly from foundations and, and other people. So we have a certain cost of capital. And then we make money by essentially being in the order book and trying to capture as much as possible of the spread. So we essentially get paid over time to take risk because we pushed, uh, as, I, as I was saying earlier, we pushed into a position because you want to buy we don't necessarily want to sell, but necessarily sell. We want to sell at you know that price, and then we hope that we can hedge it, as in we can buy back whatever we sold to you. We hope we can buy it back at a slightly lower price. But let's say I I want to buy a token, and then um, you guys have to sell order. So now you're buying that token at that sell order, and then do you hope that? Maybe you can sell it at a different exchange at you know a better price than or buy it 
buy it at a better price than uh, you sold it to me, or do you hope that the price moves? Market making is actually, this, this summarizes, it's quite simple. It's quite simple to explain, but quite difficult to implement. It's probably, market making is just, what what do I think this underlying so this, the Bitcoin is worth at time T? How wide do I want to quote? And how what sort of size do I want to quote it? So you just have width, quote size, and then your your mid price or what what I think the theoretical value of the the, the token is, and then we quote around this. And as yes, there's small amounts of money that come from arbitraging, so basically be able to sell, uh, you know, near enough at the same time, sell on one exchange, uh, the same asset, and just buy it, buy it, buy it on another exchange at a, at a lower price. But yeah, often it's just is is pretty much trying to you know price price things as as well as possible. So. It's, it turns out to be like it's much more about, it's quite a competitive space in the way that well, to be able to trade both sides, we need to be really within the shred. So we need to be, you know, the best offer on one side and the best bid on the other side. And it's, um, it's very infrastructure it's driven. So it means that we need to be able to, to adjust the orders safely so we don't get taken out by other people. Um, so there's some infrastructure cost in that. And obviously, I like have, you know, there's capital constraints, there's this cost of capital. Uh, that uh, you know, because we we we, we borrow all these assets. Yeah. Long story short, is that we 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 make money by uh, taking a risk. By you know, we don't necessarily want to be short. This is Bitcoin. We want to buy Bitcoin. And now, if you have different uh, different companies that compete, uh, uh, different market makers that compete. I mean, you mentioned you know you need to be the top or top three and stuff to make money. But what? What differentiates the you know the top from the other players? So that's a that's an interesting discussion I had even in Trotfly when I was I was at my first venture in trading in 2011, and I exited in 2014, and I was looking at um, trying some other Trotfly firms and just trying to trying to learn from other people. Basically, my first venture I was the senior, the one senior trader there, and I and I thought I didn't really learn enough. And I think a lot of it is actually much more about like a cultural differentiation. I think if you can attract the right talent, because people are very honest and they can actually just build. But I think I think there's an aspect of uh, people being aligned and being 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 there and being traders for the right reasons. Often people don't actually stay traders just for money. It's a, it can be quite rewarding financially, but it's actually often people just get if you are just interested in money, they just get the first bonus and they sort of leave and they do something else that's a lot less stressful. Uh, so either people people can like math, they like whatever problem solving, they like they, there's other aspects that make it interesting. And the math comes in like because when you it's basically around determining this, so the midpoint, the width, and things like that. That's when you use some kind of data analysis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You try to you try to predict as well as possible. Yeah, it's never an exact science. Which is why infrastructure comes into play quite heavily, where it becomes a more exact science because you, you end up trading very high frequency. I think some people know the term HFT is sort of high frequency trading as a, as a fact. And you end up trading, you end up making money every day, at least at the start, and, 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 and ideally every hour, um, because you trade very, very high frequencies here. So they're trading, I think we trade four, five, six million times a day these days. Um, so it becomes very granular. So it just um, it also becomes very infrastructure dependent. So it means it means you need to you need to have essentially fifty plus people to uh, to go and um, you know cover um, just make sure that everything is running smoothly. And especially in a crypto space between sort of between CFI, DeFi, between the OTC side of the business, between an API offering, you end up crossing quite a few things. Getting into this a little bit, like what if you compare market making in a traditional market versus crypto? You know, what's the what are the biggest things that you need to be good at? Uh, you know, specifically to do well in the crypto markets. So I can tell you what I think. I think is a good differentiation for the business is that we build a very good brand and reputation by being being honest people and not looking for like the the short term. Optimal, but we can really wish well for alignment long term. So I think that was that was quite key. 
So maybe you can explain why that matters because you think if, oh, if you just have the orders in the exchange and, you know, it just takes the best order, I don't even know who's on the other side. So on, on that side, it sort of shouldn't matter, right? So as soon as you try to OTC, you face counterparties, what we call counterparties. They're not really customers as such. They're just because we try to, what we call as principal. So we try to own capital. Um, so essentially, you want to be reliable, like when you show a price, basically, you know, you, you're there um, for a certain price, for a certain size, for X amount of time. So reliability is uh, like being more predictable is worth something. So market making can be done. I think people in crypto space are used to hear the term towards foundations, but it's also towards exchanges. So if you're reliable towards exchanges to that when things move around and so on, then the exchanges... Um, the exchange is just the room essentially, and then you need the, the exchange needs people like us to be in the room to trade with some other many of the users. And if you're reliable as a market maker on an exchange, and you know you're there when when things move and so on, essentially the users will have better execution, will have a better experience in general, and and that's quite that's quite valuable to an exchange. Um, and then you just build a good good relationship with us a long time. So it's more akin to a partnership with an exchange. Than, than anything else. And then do the exchanges also pay directly for the liquidity you provide? Very nice and ones do, but like usually usually they don't. You know, you, you want to be in a situation where they're big enough where they they they're big enough so that the opportunities they show are just yeah, they way there to take risk with our money and, and uh, take risk, you know, providing liquidity as such. But then the exchange should be there to um what to bring new users on board and do the do the onboarding into the crypto space essentially. One thing I didn't mention that's really really key to how we build the business is that, uh, and especially the difference between crypto and um, crypto and then the the, the tradfi space is that there's a whole DeFi element that we we actually focused on early on, especially from 2019, and we found it it was quite a good differentiation to the business, but also it's something that we could only do because we were much long, longer term focus. So essentially we took VC money and we were we very much pitched ourselves and we still see ourselves as a, as a tech company first before being a trading company. So we essentially took Quanto, you know, VC money, which was just quite different from having investors from a hedge fund space or a trading space, which means that we didn't have actually people on our back asking every day like what the results were. And we had more people, much more patient, just building, uh, letting us build infrastructure first. So 2019, we started on uh, um, on DYDX, for example, in around August 2019. And that enabled the rest of the business to actually be more robust around essentially on-chain transfers um, to the point that we we're probably driving Nansen users quite crazy at some point thinking that they, they were following smart money, but they were just seeing transfers going back and forth. You know? <laughs> so, so if you have tens of thousands of transfers, I don't know, I don't know what sort of signal they can get from it, but probably not, not much from us. So I think that's a big differentiation of being able to trade on chain is, is quite a differentiation from the trot fight. What's the biggest difference about trading on chain versus on centralized exchanges? There's, there's aspects around obviously just direct integration with the chain, but there's aspects of um, while managing your own custody, thinking of potential, you know, sandwich. Uh, attacks as such, uh, thinking of the risk of actually not really being failed as well. If uh, you know the, the cost of just you know uh, pushing for a transaction and not always knowing exactly when the block is going to be you know confirmed, uh, there's there's a there's quite different level of uncertainty in terms of you know what you traded and what you didn't trade uh, between you know DeFi and essentially CFI and like the tra- traditional finance. So these these things are quite is quite different. On the other side, once you've made the effort to integrate and to build a certain amount of DeFi knowledge, then this, you know, if it's a barrier to entry for you, it's a barrier to entry for for the people as well. So, um, so yeah, this is whatever it becomes. It becomes a it becomes a competitive advantage. There's some aspects that we we realized later as we were starting to invest. So we started to invest in uh, different projects from late 2020, essentially from the summer of 2020. Um, when I think it was probably DYDX for the 
I don't know if it was a Series A or Series B at the time already. Um, but essentially, because of the operational experience and trading experience and dealing with these these uh, DeFi protocols, we had a good amount of insights on just doing a technical due diligence for investing. So it, we ended up just um, we ended up building like different relationships with VC firms, for example, who just basically were coming to us and like not only from a, a potential trading perspective to help you know build some of the volumes for them, but also in terms of just getting feedback on due diligence on just just how robust was a certain protocol, for example. Well, what do you feel like were the key things that allowed Wintermute to get you know become so big? I mean, it's a very competitive space, right? Uh, full alignment of planet. Full alignment of. <laughs> so full alignment of planet, where where you want to get into a position. There's a bit of an execution play in terms of because we we had a really good team to start with in terms of the experience we had and so on. So I had experience raising money. Evgeny built essentially. It's the first company Evgeny ever built, but it, he had a um, he built the ETF arm of a of a large market maker or trying to try to find market maker in Europe. Um, so he, he had good experience in ETFs, and I had good experience in not only option trading but also just raising raising funding as such. And our first ETF was quite quite good in terms of getting the first skeleton of infrastructure. So we had a, we had some de-risking there. Um, one factor that was interesting is because we ended up closing the first round of funding in, with quite a lot of difficulty in the middle of 2018 crypto winter. We ended up in a space that was actually quite empty and then we ended up dealing with 30 you know uh, OG groups in crypto like blockchain and Clum and so on who are quite happy to have us around and um, you know in winters basically the pond is very small so you, you only have like a few fish that survive there and then it's actually quite a good this is pretty healthy interaction just the if you're resilient enough and you're just quite quite happy there I think you guys you guys started around the same time you were about six and a half seven years old as well no yeah 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 of course when we started at um, yeah basically start of 2018 I think it's excellent for the like in terms of the the base because you're just very focused on building you're not really distracted with just like like we are nowadays it's very distracting um but it's fine I'm just more more than happy to see like new eyes and so on it's just or the price do the prices do the marketing for us essentially, but in general it's kind of it's easier to start. I think having this pretty good history even in Web two and Web one and so on in terms of people building successful companies starting in like in crisis years, uh, so that that was helpful. I think it was really helpful that two things. It was really helpful that Yevgeny had a really clear idea of like being tech fast and being like very much product driven and being you know everything being automated and um we never really had trader roles we've always had um dev slash quant slash trader roles so anyone basically just codes and like everything gets into in, in, in into play very 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 soon very very quickly you mean so this this basically means that like it was always to focus on like, you know, building a system and building algorithms as opposed to, because I mean, I guess it's always algorithms with market making, no? I mean, I guess the people not doing this manually. No, but you'd be surprised that there's a lot of Chan5 firms who who have very separate roles between people who, there's quant roles, people who build the algos, they're actually traders who do like much more manual trading actually. Um, so you'd be surprised that we, we still have, even in crypto, we still have competitors who are actually trading a lot more manually than you would think. Um, so I think there was, there was a strong tech focus there. Um, and the, the tech, the motto is things being reliable and scalable, essentially. Um, and then on my side, I had good experience with, you know, raising, raising equity and raising debt. Uh, so we had the capital, that access to capital, uh, sorted and we were, all very aligned in the vision of having, um, like in terms of the culture, having essentially it was more startup like when we started than now. We had to find, um, we had to compensate people with a hybrid of like bonus and shares over time because they were just getting poached a bit too too much by essentially hedge funds and um, you know, anyone who wanted to enter the space because the shares were too like too much of a long term thing and. 
Yeah, so it's uh, it's still a still a balancing act, but I think we've got something quite quite nice nowadays. Where I think I think you'll end up with something like uh, yeah, a program where people have a few shares, but they get some some bonus once a year or so, and then they can reinvest that bonus as a, as 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 they choose. And they, 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 we we start to need to have basically some secondary rounds here and there. Like reinvest the bonus in in like buying shares or in like lending into the company or something. Yeah, yeah, essentially. So, and and we we very much want to. We have some VC shareholding as such, but we really want to be as employee owned as possible. And and it makes a ton of sense for for uh, for companies that you know trade their own capital essentially, because you want best alignment possible between people who. Who trade and people who you know own you know own, own the capital. These things we got right. Some of the things were difficult to fully align on at the start because some of the things are much longer term in terms of building the brand, building the, the BD side of the business versus building building the the day to day algo and trading side of the business. But I think we got we clicked around you know late nineteen early to two thousand twenty. When we had the first, you know, first COVID hits in, in March and the first big dips in uh, the first big dips in uh, in the Bitcoin at the time, well, actually we saw all the algos actually quite robust, and we started to slowly, slowly to make real money. But essentially, we started to we were building the rocket for two years, and we only started to really put fuel in the rocket two and a half years in or so. Uh, so, so that, that took that took some time. Well, was that because that the algorithms weren't good enough? Some of it, some of it was because of this. Some of it was because we didn't, we had not, we had not rich enough of a critical mass between what we could show exchanges that what we could become. Because essentially, you know, exchanges you need to, you need to build a certain volume to actually get into better and better fee schedules. That was a challenge, and then it's simply like we we had not built enough in terms of getting yeah getting to cheap cheap enough access to 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 debt as well. Uh, so we're using, you know, equity, equity fundraising to, you know, hire and you know build the tech. But actually, for for trading itself, we needed to to borrow and and getting slowly getting access to inventory was a uh, was a uh, yeah, it becomes a bit binary basically. It's, nowadays, we're one of the two to three firms to get essentially first steps on on access to inventory uh, because we're quite reliable and because we 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 try to do things quite quite. Well. When you say access to inventory, what do you mean? Your ability to borrow tokens from other teams or other people in general. So inventory is so it's, we we trade what we call market neutral. So we don't make money; things go up and down. But it means we need to we can't we can't buy inventory all the time. Uh, we can't buy the tokens themselves because if we buy the tokens, then we're sensitive to things going down. But um, often we can we can quote a lot larger size by simply borrowing the tokens and trade around it yeah yeah i mean i, I guess you can see also here the sort of um advantages of size no because like yeah you you trade more and then because you're trading so much the i guess the exchange trading fees matter a lot and then uh makes it hard for someone to compete yeah 2019 we we still had the down year because we 80 plus percent of the money we were making trading was going into fees. Wow. But it was just, and something like a rule of thumb that kind of works for me, like for, for previous terms, I don't know exactly where we are nowadays, but it was more like if a third of the, the money we make, if you make like $1 on a trade and you spend 30 cents in fees, you can kind of run a business. Um, because you still have financing costs because you still have to pay your people you still have some, you know, if you still have money left, you still have to pay bonuses and taxes and stuff. <laughs> so, so, so like one third is maybe like moderately, but it's where, where you, you can start scaling. But, um, but yeah, 2019 was essentially 80% of the money going to exchange fees. In terms of the interviews, company culture, you talk, I mean, you mentioned some things, but you mentioned this thing of like, you know, trying to be a sort of startup mentality, having like, sense of ownership and, and also it's like long-term focus. Do you feel like there are other things about the interviews culture or maybe the way you've hired people that have been crucial? There's a bit of, um, 
So for further background, I think I mentioned, uh, maybe I didn't make it clear. Um, Evgeny and I used to work for a company called Optiva in, uh, in Amsterdam. So they're, they're, they're quite a large firm still, they're very much an option firm in TradFi. And uh, and it's very much the Dutch culture is 100% imprinted in that company and uh, and how you know brutally honest Dutch people are. And then <laughs> essentially it's, it's part of the culture. There's also a big differentiation where we, we took we took the best from, from it in a way that it's a completely company wide bonus pool, and we took the same thing, here, which is what I what I noticed that. And a lot of training firms are structured very differently. A lot of training firms have like little siloed teams, and no one shares information. But actually, when you're in a firm and training firm that actually has a company wide bonus pool, people do behave a lot more like shareholders or such, or or at least think that uh, if they share knowledge with you know junior the senior people are sharing knowledge with junior people, it it just there's there's a lot more of that dynamic when people are people are happy to to teach other people, and that's basically some percentage of the profits go into this bonus pool, and then how do you determine who gets how much of that bonus pool? Mm, there's still a still something that that we're working on to to perfect, but uh, there's this philosophy that even people like with us, there's even people like in legal, so like or can't say like everyone is a PNL contributor to a degree. We have internal recruiters and so on and, and external recruiters, but let's say we also assume that everyone helps recruiting. So I think there's a few functions like this where obviously like we want people to feel that owners as much as possible. Uh and, and I think that's that that has worked well. I think uh I mean a general advice for how many people do you have nowadays in the chorus one? Because we're only like 60-ish, 65, something like that. And when did you, I'm assuming at the start you were always involved with hiring. When did you stop being involved with hiring? Oh, I still am. I'm still, still interviewing. Okay, that's good. That's good. Yeah, okay. yeah, I'm still interviewing basically everybody. My rule of thumb is like the first 20 people or so, it's really, really key to get right. Because then they, you imprint the culture of the company basically on the first maybe five, 10, 20 people. And then they actually do. Then it's actually people you hired who, who, who help you scale in that way and least scale culturally. Yeah, I know. I'm still, for, I, for me, I see like interviewing as like just really crucial. And and I think I'm pretty good at it. So I I focus quite a lot on it. And, and, and at the same time, I feel we haven't figured it out. Well, or like I, I, like one of the things I still really want to do, and I don't think we're there, is sort of to figure out how to um, formalize or systematize like the interviews I do, so that I feel like okay, I can have like other people do it. I mean, there was just there's a few people that uh, last year I was out for like a few months or like a month and a half because I had this like health issue. So then uh, there was a few people we hired that I didn't interview, but I've interviewed. Except for like three or four people, I've interviewed everybody. That's interesting. I get less and less involved with it. I don't know. I mean, I, I need to check with you again. I'm pretty sure he doesn't get involved with everyone. But I think we very structured. Maybe, maybe we've got too many rounds of interviews and stuff. Maybe now. How many rounds do you guys have? Like for a BD person, it's about five. They go through like a use case and so on. Um, for technical interviews, for like, like some of the ops or some of the some of the the infrastructure guys, I'm I'm not too sure, but I think I mean beyond that, I think the cultural fit is still really a key part of it. I think if they yeah if they fit in the culture, and it's kind of the the challenge of the question now that we're expanding across Asia is just maintaining that culture. When you where, say uh, see that they fit in the culture, like how do you how do you what questions do you ask or how do you assess that cultural fit? We get, so it d- d- depends on the role. Often for like traders who move from John Fi to crypto, we know, ex- we don't, we'll have some ex colleagues, we'll know people who, who know them, we can get a lot of third party validation. I think there's a, there's a, there's a red line around like very much like honesty, that's quite key. Uh, Long term focus. Yeah, people being entrepreneurial, being quite self reliant, to be honest, like quite, quite, se- I, I like to see, self-propelled like you just don't really need to just push that much 
we have a lot of people in the company that I can just go and ping at 3, 4 a.m. Like, I need to tell them to go to bed. So my head of trading is like this. Like, there's a few people like this. <laughs> like, <laughs> I think, I think there's, a, there's a strain of workaholism, but uh, that's, I like to think it's well-placed enough, but then you need to force people to be on holidays. You know, though, um, quite a few people in the BD team in, in Singapore are like this. Yeah, I, th- I think there's this 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 few elements like this and like sort of the work ethics is very key. And thinking long term enough and uh being much more mission driven than mercenaries and so on. The challenge is I think hiring, like the interview process is, is often not sufficient. So I think it's just like the the you know, the first one, two, three first month is, is often key to make sure that we didn't make a mistake. But um we don't. I think we we've done a good enough job to be honest, like surprisingly enough, and in, in that in the hiring because we don't like we don't let that many we don't have many people even leaving that much or uh, we did hire fairly slowly. Think about it, like founded in you know July 2017, we had the first hire in September, we officially October 2018. And then finished the year with like basically five people total. Finished 2020, barely 10 or 12. Finished 2021. We did all of 2021 with between 20 and 25 people. And now they really started to hire more because we, we, we turned much more into a product company from 2022. And I think we finished with 50 people 2022 or so. So slowly, really, really slowly hiring. But thanks to that, we never, we never had a, we never had any rounds of layoffs or so. Yeah, yeah, that's very similar with us. One of the things that uh, I've noticed, of course, one in terms of hiring that I feel like has been one of the most reliable predictors is whether people are really passionate about crypto. And and it happened a bunch of times that we hired people who were, you know, they seemed like a good fit in other regards. Or like, you know, we really needed someone for the position, but they didn't really seem to care much about crypto. And then none of these have worked out they all ended up leaving basically yeah we had this with uh it was more 2022 or such but like i think people some people are a bit too optimi- too opportunistic i think maybe they had some fumble from 21 and then it's sort of like start and then they just come in and then the winter starts or something like this and um we have people who are sometimes tempted by tried fire as well and it's true that 22 maybe early 23 was actually quite busy in effects and commodities and it's like, that's fine. Like, there's a few people leaving, but it's it's far from being the rule. Like, usually people stay and, you know, understand understand the cycles. And I mean, whatever, there's pros and cons to any side of the cycle, to be honest. It's, it's a bit of a filter as well. Um, and I'm with you that people wanted to have some passion or buy into the vision of the space, at least in terms of either democratization or like be a bit like, Slightly libertarians, whatever, like, you know, they need to buy to the vision of the space at least. They don't have to be as like crypto believers as, you know, Evgeny and I. Well, we're quite strong libertarians. I I went into crypto thinking that basically sort of crowdfunding had a bit failed. I was really into crowdfunding this in 2012. In terms of democratizing investing and so on, I thought I was trying to stay. And it's not that like, you know, it's so many rules around being a sophisticated investor and so on. Like, especially in the US, like if you try crowdfunding in the US, it's just, it's a bit of a, I mean, it's, 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 it's not really crowdfunding. You need 5 million on your bank account outside of your house to qualify to be able to, to invest and so on. So, uh, I, I mean, different actually, cultures I wanna, and different I want to qualify. I was just thinking about what I said before. I want to qualify it a little bit. I think it's it's passionate or, or at least very curious about it. I think we've also had people who worked out who were like, I'm kind of skeptical about crypto, but I'm also very interested in it. And like, I'm trying to understand it and like, that 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 I think is also so some in, indifference is probably more than a thing of like that that is like okay if people have feel like it's just a sense of indifference about it then it then they didn't work. <laughs> yeah, that's a bit worrying, Ben. That is probably it's probably a massive red flag to bears. Um we've had people who like depending on the roles, we've had good success with people who actually came from Trot Five who are used to like too much structure to a degree. Like they work the banks or so, and they were frustrated of like not being able to do enough. And and we've had good success with them because they, you know, some of them had traded crypto or like PA or so. 
And um, I know this is a balance because we actually, we want people to understand regulation. We understand people that, like, like, like understand like a not as, like a, like a good long-term framework. Um, so sometimes people who are just purely crypto native are not a good fit. They don't understand how, you know, markets should work and so on and how, how it works long term. But um, yeah, you need a balance. And it's good if people have gone to, you know, both, both worlds, both, you know, both have some experience with crypto, some experience with DreadFi. And I think having it just ends up yielding the best profiles. We have pretty good experience hiring straight from university as well. But for more technical roles, you see, like, uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's for, it's, it depends on the roles. So you mentioned uh, building, right? And, and I guess one of the things that, uh, you know, that you guys have been building that has, uh, you know, has become pretty significant is uh, rsync, which is, uh, is it the, I guess the largest uh, block below on Ethereum or certainly it's one of the largest. 25 is one of three large, I think, I think this, it's, a it's one of the even three largest, to, certainly. Yeah. yeah. I think it is 25% of block building. I don't know the latest numbers, but I think you should know that better than me. But. Yeah. <laughs> well, I know it's one of the largest. I don't know exactly right now, but um, so why why did you guys decide to do that? And what's sort of the the connection between the block builder and the market making? I think it's 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 a good representation of the fact that we tech first, that we we very much build this first and uh, an analogy that, that I like to use and you probably heard me say this a few times but I'm not necessarily a fan of Google but like Google is, is a good example that if you if you think of Google it's a tech firm it's a tech firm first and they happen to make money from advertising yeah. essentially and then um, we want to be and, and, and we are tech first and we happen to make money from trading but essentially what we do day to day is 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 tech building so there's only a now there's about 10 people like like more like me, who's just more like externally facing and do the more commercial aspects of the business. But most other people are basically product buildings, infrastructure building, and so on. Um, so our thing comes into play as a, as a subsidiary as such to to help with block building. And it's just, you know, making sure that, you know, we, we part of the block confirmations as such. We are quite cautious of not being too vertically integrated. So I think the good example of that is on our uh, DYDX v4, for example, we made sure that we actually we actually lend a lot of our tokens as, as well. So we help other people to to uh, to um, confirm transactions, for example. And we want to keep things, you know, we want to keep you know, things being a, a fair game. So yeah, while while having some control on on block building, not to be you know completely squeezed out of trade. So so that it's part of the it's part of it's part of yeah being. Very much part of the DeFi ecosystem in general. You, you need to you need to have some some infrastructure built to be able to participate in trading. And so, block building basically means right that it's an entity right that basically gets transactions either from the mempool or that people directly send to this block builder, and then you know basically put it together in a block, and then you know sends that to you know relayers and validators, and and the one that sort of has the highest monetary value that um, implied that it's the one that goes in there. And, and sort of the, the attractiveness here is, for example, um, that, you know, you can sort of construct your own blocks and put in all of the um, arbitrage, tra- all of the transactions, the on-chain transactions that you guys want to do. And I guess you can also prevent being sandwiched in, in that block. Is that sort of the main? Because you, you guys would still... Would you still submit transactions to other block builders or like all of the intermute transactions that you guys do? That's a good question. You need to ask one of my DeFi guys to get the, the full <laughs> answer. But I'm I'm assuming I'm assuming we do because we we you know we we would still look if if another block builder is a performing better, the trading team can still independently just just push this to 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 a better block builder. Um, like many in the space, we used uh, flashbots in the past and, and, uh, and others. So I'm sure um works a bit like an auction, but it, it needs to stay competitive enough to a degree there's enough competition in-house to make things more efficient. Um, because if we don't keep things efficient enough, uh, even if it's between different teams, basically in-house, then some of the competition will take it away. You know what I mean? If we only favor 
are on blocks, then it doesn't, at some point it becomes inefficient. It's a good question. Uh, and I'm assuming, yeah, I'm assuming we'll use other blocks, but it's true that in terms of defending ourselves with, uh, against Sandra Shataxi, you want to have some, some control there as well. So I'm curious also a bit about uh, your thoughts and sort of the long-term evolution, both of crypto and of like what it means for a company like Wintermute and, and maybe like some of the topics I'm curious your opinion about, you know, one is, you know, do you think that in the future, you know, sort of like most assets will be blockchain based and that's how markets work. Do you think that decentralized exchanges are going to overtake centralized exchanges and, you know, those will be the largest exchanges and marketplace in the future or like how, where do you see things going? Yeah, so it's funny because I've had different answers to those questions over the years. <laughs> it's it's um, one thing is I'm one of these guys who who's cautious with like you know people like Larry Fink, for example, just saying everything will be tokenized. I think a lot of things will be tokenized, but I think for some aspects, like like around RWA, for example, so we, well, what assets are like around sort of like tokenized equity and stuff. It's been tried before. And, and some of it, if it doesn't bring a sufficient like factor of improvement, it's just quite difficult to to distribute and just to get to get adoption. Um, so I think I think it will happen, but it won't happen all at the same time. There's a few things in the crypto space that I'm still really eager to see. And like, so I'm I'm in Asia now for six months because we trade derivatives from from Singapore from the Singapore office. And I think there's a big thing that's still not happening if you if you compare the crypto space with TradFi. There's still very, very little volumes in options, for example. So essentially, options in TradFi trade about is 25% of the total volumes. And in crypto, it's, like, it's, it's a tiny percentage. It's just single, a very low single digits. And I, and I think it, there's a few, few factors to explain that, but I think it's just like with a bit more, that actually positively institutionalization of the space, there will be, there will be more people around the table and actually we'll get, we'll get more derivatives there. Moderate is mean more price, you know, better, better price discovery down to the the underlying tokens, so down to the base spot token as well. That's the second trend. So they're like more derivatives, more tokenization for sure. I think it was 25th of April 2022. I gave a talk in at Davos about DeFi flipping CFI. And I was quite happy to just go talk you DeFi. Have such a memory, you have such a memory for dates. Whenever you were like mentioning date, you were like, exactly, okay. It was incorporated on the 5th of July. 25th, 25th. <laughs> it's, it used to be a small secret trick. There's, 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 uh, there's, there's, the, there's very few things I'm good at. So just remembering people and remembering dates. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's funny because I was at this, uh, I don't know, I don't know, like I'm going to name the foundation because they invited me to speak there, but at one inch had like a little uh, booth and so on. I had like pretty, pretty, pretty nice discussion there. And we were just right next to WEF and they were all, you know, WEF guys that are, um, they basically all talk about, oh, 90% of the money is DeFi, is like criminal money and blah, 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 so it's all rubbish. We all know it's rubbish. But uh, but I was happy to talk about like potentially, you know, what we needed for DeFi to flip CFI. And um, it was interesting because there was like, so so April 22, as I mentioned, obviously we had FTX in November. And then my first reaction when FTX went down was like, oh, people will realize that the Fed is because of centralization and that people would just go for DeFi and so on. And the problem is that um, I was talking about this with my partner at the time was that it's like, um, actually CFI is very good for adoption. For CFI, CFI basically the centralized exchanges regardless of you know risk of fraud and centralization and so on. It's very much there, there to onboard. They actually onboard the new users. And when people get sufficiently familiar with the tech and so on and get sufficiently incentivized to basically do custody themselves and essentially confident enough and like detect to actually send, you know, send funds on chain, um, then they really are part of DeFi. But at the time it was about, so 22 is about 400 million total users like across the crypto space. And you had about 6 million, four and a half, whatever, four, four, let's call it, uh, I think, sorry, it was 300 million total users in the crypto space and there was about 400, uh, four and a half million DeFi users per se. And, uh, and now it's doubled across the board, but I see the percentage of DeFi users stays the same. And it's a bit of like, there's a bit of a failure in terms of like DeFi in the way that um, 
We did have like good traction around DeFi summer because there was like zero yield everywhere or negative yields in most of the places, and basically DeFi was able to to attract some users through through you know having some yield. But essentially, there was a whole phase afterwards where well, TradFi actually get it up ended up getting yield again, and um, and I think the DeFi space and essentially crypto was just a bit struggling on the on the on the yield front, so not not super attractive there. Um, I think there's still a lot of things to solve in terms of. UX, UI, getting that leverage in DeFi, that some sort of you know credit scoring in, in the meantime and so on. A lot of people are building pretty cool things to help solve these things, but I think we still end up with this sort of bottleneck from the, like for DeFi to really flip. CFI is actually still quite challenging because if you see how people are bought into the crypto space, it's still very much CFI first and then. But if you if you think like you know twenty years or ten like a long term future. So I think DeFi will, can can be more much more prevalent once you get um like when, once you get robots everywhere once you get like a proper Internet of Things because then whatever your fridge buying your food automatically based on what you've eaten the day before and stuff your fridge is not scared of like sending funds online or well, your fridge is not scared of doing the custody or stuff or like probably does this this. Maybe you just have your house wallet or whatever you want to phrase it. Yeah, and you can have you can have your fridge fridge sandwich to the heating system. <laughs> yeah, it's like disproportionate like hacking risk as well. But um, but I think it's like the machine to machine trade. And it's also sort of like this in twenty years time. I think I think you I think it's pretty normal. But uh, I think I think I think that's that's probably pushes DeFi first. Um, and it's surprisingly, if you talk to institutions, a lot of them are like there's a few. Even three years ago, I had this um, side chat, this sort of chat house, like chat of um, after the panel at a, a London conference, and they were like traditional. So in traditional finance, you have like these guys who call like very much custodians who hold all the people's money, and so like this top ten out there, that whatever JP Morgan is one of them, but like um, I think BNY. Um, there's a few Australians there as well, and there's a few of these custodians who are completely ready to think of a world where DeFi is first. But basically, they want they want to be the wallet. So they basically their thing is like, okay, people can trade trade bilaterally everywhere, but like they want to be they want to secure the funds the same way. So there's a few to that. I don't know how much we have to pay them, but um, it's you know I think I think I think that can work. Uh, the reality is just it's not it's not, it's not happening yet. It's not happening yet. And maybe one more topic when it comes to sort of you know the future. What about AI? Like, what do you think is the impact of AI on like Vintimute? Very little in terms of pricing and so I mean, most of what we do is already pretty automated. I think there's a really annoying aspect that I'm trying to get my head around um, is on the commercial side, is around risk of fraud or people impersonating and so on. It's more and more possible the tech is there for you to think that. You could have had the podcast with me, but you could have had the podcast with someone else sitting in, you know, from the 50 Cent Army and actually just yeah. not using Gemini, <laughs> uh, not using, uh, you know, using using some some uh, some AI tool to basically replicate how I move, how I speak, and so on, and think you have a commercial call, and then um, and uh, convince you to send me money for like, you know, uh, for a deal and so on. Yeah, I think I think we're not too far away from having to go back to like physical locations and like having different offices in different countries and then just having people to just check in that you know that we have this. But actually blockchain solves some of this because you think of that, like, you know, uh you know, for for us to have, you know, either it's linked with an address, that's like we recentralize it or not. We, we we have a few points of validation that we can check and we can we can function trustlessly. Um but it's yeah, that's 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 a bit that's a bit of a concern, uh, because there's, there's aspects of our life in AI or so on, like in tech in general, where we we favor convenience over privacy over many other things, you know, over security, and I think it's a bit of the risk there as well. So I don't know how, how do you see uh, you see AI affecting your business as well. I mean, for us, it's a pretty significant focus. I mean, we we have like a team that's like focused on basically building sort of like. I, well, I, I think the, the obvious thing uh, is that I think it could just, 
improve everyone's productivity by like maybe you know maybe 20 percent, maybe 50 percent, maybe 100 percent, like but by, by, by a lot but then i think to do that you know it's not like easy i don't think you would get that just from like using like chat gpt or something but you actually have to like integrate it into how the entire organization works so that that is like a focus for us i think that is the sort of thing where it can go, become like something that's you know very compounding where okay maybe maybe this year will help us like five percent right but maybe next year it will be 20 percent. then maybe the year afterwards it will be like 50 percent. then and and then i think these uh yeah these effects can just become like massive over time AI is like, for me, AI is like, so I used to invest in uh, businesses in more web too. And you can sort of put them in like optimization, automation, or discovery. And like, and then if you get, so by the sound of it, what you think is, is more optimization. This stage is still like a 10, 20%, you know, uh, marginal improvement on your site. But I, uh, I think if it just, if you just get generally inside, like if you get the discovery aspect of that, that's actually quite useful. What do you mean with discovery? Yeah, discovery is like, um, think of an AI that can think of like, you know, uh, uh, AlphaGo is probably uh, uh, an example of this, like, some, you know, an AI is playing completely differently. Or um, I don't know if you, if you apply AI to like biology and just finding, like discovering like new treatments or so. I think that will probably emerge, right? I, but I think the first thing is like, kind of like, I mean, for example, one thing is like, uh, in terms of a sort of thing we would like to have. So right now, you know, we run all this infrastructure for, you know, lots of different blockchains. And then, you know, we have all these engineers on call and then there, you know, systems to like alert and then something happens and there's someone has to look at it and then like respond to it. So like, for example, can you build a system that like knows how all of the issues that have arisen and all the ways they've been resolved. And if there is an alert, it can like basically, well, autonomously resolve it. Or, or maybe at least suggest to the engineer that comes up, hey, this is alert, probably you should do this, right? Um, and then maybe they can check, but maybe at some point it's not necessary to check. You can just go ahead and do it. So something like that is, for example, something we want, yeah, we want to build. But it's not easy. I mean, this, it's going to take... Uh, probably going to take two years or something. What is it? It's, uh, I think it's 83 was neural networks. 2006 was the Bots, Bosman, how do you call it? Bosman machines and so on. And then, um, like, it took a really long time. I think a lot of progress has been made in AI just by, like, doing, just playing around with a, an optimization curve. I think people were quite surprised with this, how far we went. And um, I don't know, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't looked at this. I played around with ChatGPT and so on more recently, but it's like, uh, them are quite interesting because essentially anything that deals with words used to be considered very, very difficult. Like you could, you could before you could build some trees, you could build some things that actually just do like chatbots, you could build them like in a very narrow, in a narrow sort of a lexicon. So no sort of like very narrow context. And now the fact that we can have LLMs is quite, quite interesting. So I don't know. I think it's, it's often the thing that like we sort of over overestimate where we can get in two years and we massively underestimate the changes that in 10 years time. So we'll see, uh, we'll see, we'll see where we are there. I'm just curious about the last, maybe the last thing. So I understand like, you, you know, like a lot of languages and you learn a lot of languages. I'm curious, like how, how do you learn languages and how do you maintain the languages that you learn? I learned them fast and I maintained them very difficult. It's very difficult for me to maintain them. So I'm, I'm, I'm still maintaining about five. And um, when I don't work 24 seven, I, I, I used to just have a, just watch movies or read or trying to read in a language or, or try to, like I love Singapore for like Asian languages because you can maintain Chinese. I can maintain some Japanese. I can learn Korean slowly with the limited time I have. There's two to three big dimensions. There's something in learning that you call schemas. It's sort of like the scaffoldings of like how you learn. So essentially, uh, um, let's say if you're French, let's say this, you have similar schemas to like Spanish and Italian and so on. So basically like, like same sort of framework. And I see it's quite easy for you to, like, to learn other Latin languages. Um, but once you just like you're European and you learn Asian language, like it takes a while to, to get there. 
if you've got good memory for new words, it's useful. But there's still a dimension where even you understanding like rough grammar is not sufficient to really just you know like to to to, to put words and speak perfectly. I think a good way to do things is just consider yourself a child and basically don't don't be fussed about making mistakes. Like I just half joke about torturing people and like learning a new language, but basically you're torturing people who are gonna listen to you, like basically you're gonna make mistakes and so on. And I think people are especially when you learn a new language as an adult, people are too fussed about making mistakes. And I think it's this a big it's it's a good lesson for learning in general. Like it applies to languages where it's useful. When you learn a language, you focus on one at a time, or do you sometimes learn multiple at the same time? Just one at a time, usually. One at one at a time is much easier. The thing is to get to a level where you should be able to have a at least a conversation, or at least watch a watch or read like kids kind of material or so sort of like simple things, because you want to be able to maintain it, and then you can only maintain it if you can have a mix of active and passive learning. So active learning is really you literally like learning new words and so on and learning new sentences and practicing. And passive is basically just you watch a you watch a K drama show or so there are. You know, uh, it, it's much more passive, but at least what's quite key is get your ears to hear all the sounds. And I found this quite, so I found it difficult for like Korean, for example. Life with Chinese is really difficult to get around all the tones. I mean, just the tones, and I just 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 generally get around it. Um, many people use soft tones in Chinese as well, so it's more like you just need to end up ha- having to to learn, you know, to say like the same thing in three different ways, and I just make sure that you can be understood. Then just by practicing and be be a bit shameless about practicing and just, uh, um, I think this is this is the biggest barrier for adults actually. But in general, it's just uh, I find I find this fascinating in terms of language learning because it's usually like fifty percent of the language is about gives you it gives you a good insight on the people's culture because this is about you know who speaks to who and how they articulate things and so on. It's quite just it's just a it's just a mash the top. That's just a GTA exercise, but it was my my pastime for a long time. I don't know what's 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 your favorite language or what's that to to ask very tricky questions. Well. I mean, I, I, in college, I studied quite a bit of Chinese and then I spent some time in China too, and I spoke pretty well at the time. Uh, so this was a long time ago. This was like 2006. So I was kind of, you know, I could have like a two hour dinner with someone and talk, talk in Chinese and I could like, you know, uh, and then I did not use it at all for, and I really enjoyed learning Chinese. Uh, I just found it fun, like more fun than learning other languages. And then I basically didn't practice at all, and I forgot kind of everything until like when I was in a actually when I was in Singapore, like in January, I started studying again a little bit, and so I've been studying you know every day for about you know seven six seven weeks, uh, and you know it's coming back kind of to some extent. Yeah, so I think Chinese is the one I enjoyed learning the most uh, in terms of studying the language. What I found difficult for you for Chinese and Japanese was that uh, if you just really in it and you practice every day, you can get to really, really good level, just reading and writing as well. But I find that the the spoken and so understanding people speaking and uh, you know, the general spoken level is, is not too difficult to maintain because you can watch shows and stuff and so on. But I found that maintaining reading like and, and writing at a proper level it gets very difficult with you know all the Hanzo, all the kanji. To maintain, that's something that needs to be a lot more, more long, more active on my side. But yeah, re- reading, I never managed to get to like I, I never could get to the level where I could like read a newspaper or something and like understand a I lot. Can, I can send you some some books. Can there, there's, okay. a, <laughs> there's a book by uh, someone called uh, uh, Richardson. Who's like uh, who basically he actually started with a Japanese book. The, the the legend is that he was in the seventies in Japan and basically learned like all the nineteen hundred and fourteen whatever official kanji uh, list uh, in less than three months and he used like a memory palace kind of method so he would just deconstruct the root of the kanji and basically just build around it and build a little story around it and uh, it's just called remembering kanji and actually there's a Hanzo there's a there's a Chinese uh, equivalent that's been same same writer I think it's also Richardson. 
I used this in 2009 or 10 or so. It's all the positives and the downsides of Memory Palace and when you build a story around remembering something. It's kind of slow, but you actually remember it. So it's kind of slow to recall by assigning the whole story around, oh, there's a ladder, oh, there's something, there's a moon, there's a sun, there, there's something. And then you can rebuild the, the kanji or the hadza. Um, but it's, it's, it's kind of slow, so it's, it's useful in like a first kind of practice. And then you kind of forget about the story and you just, like it goes into the long-term memory and you just, once you read it, you just, you just read the right size as, as it is. But if you have a bit of a barrier to remember them, it's quite, it's quite useful. I'll send you the reference. Cool. Well, thanks so much, Yo. It's really fu uh, fun to have you on. Really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you. Same here. Same here. Thanks so much for listening, for tuning in, and we'll be back next week.